Okay, so it's time to round off the third mechanism and um, changes in consumption patterns affecting resource, demand, energy use, and so on. And we're going to do that by talking about <laughs> reality. We talked about some different models. We said, look, maybe there's big substitution effects and rebound maybe there's big income effects driving this shift into resource and energy intensive goods but we need a reality check on these models which makes sense which don't make sense we have two models one based entirely on the income effects with no rebound one based entirely on substitution effects with 100 percent rebound and there's a paper you can look at about this But this is our first piece of key evidence. This is some data. It's slightly odd data from Germany, but it would look the same really, or more or less the same wherever you got it from. But basically what we see, this right hand graph is the easiest to understand. The most energy intense consumption we have is only 20% energy. And that is a very small proportion of expenditure. I think that's like flights. The next most intense is only like 15% energy. So if we go back to our first model, oh, this one, we had one product that was made from pure labor and one that was made from pure energy. But now we're saying actually the product that is most energy intense is only 20% energy. So the pure energy product, if you increase energy efficiency, doubled energy efficiency on it, its price would halve. But a product that is only 20% energy by cost, then if you double energy intensity, you're halving, you've got 80% of costs, a labor, 20% of energy. If you double energy efficiency, you're cutting that 20 down to 10. So total costs are going from 100 to 90. That's a 10% drop in costs. So it basically means there's hardly going to be any rebound. <laughs> okay, even for flights, if you increase the energy efficiency of mo air, the motors on jet planes and so on, the effect on the cost of the flights is just not that great. And unless you have a very high uh, elasticity of demand for flights, it's hardly going to have any effect on the amount that people fly. There's just not going to be that much rebound. So this whole rebound model is really built on the idea that some products are very energy intense. And that just doesn't seem to be the case maybe for like a light consumption in the home and so on but that's just not that important okay so basically this data is really casting a lot of doubt on the rebound model how relevant is that model to reality here's some more data that's also in that paper from 2018 so what do we see here this is trends for passenger miles and energy consumption for US private vehicles and air travel. So what have we got here? This is a log scale and years and we've got passenger miles, energy use, GDP. So we've got GDP growing, we've got passenger miles and more or less tracking GDP and energy use up until the oil crisis of the mid 70s is also tracking so we've got no increase in energy efficiency at all and then after that they start we get a little bit of relative decoupling so energy use doesn't go up quite as fast okay but can we disentangle the driving factors here so people are driving more and more as they get richer but the growth rates are equal so if we had technological improvement 
in the cars and so on, making them more energy efficient, we would expect to see decoupling. We do see a bit of decoupling, but it's not that impressive. Why is it so unimpressive? Well, let's look at these other graphs. Energy per passenger mile for cars, cars, SUVs, um, air travel and trucks. Okay. So what we can see here is that there's not much improvement except for the S for air travel. Not surprising. There's not that much improvement in the energy per passenger mile. Okay. Why not? It's basically because these vehicles, even though the um, the motors are getting more efficient, the um, vehicles are getting more and more powerful and heavier and heavier. I guess that's not the case for planes, which is why that curve is going down. But for the trucks, different types of trucks, and cars, um, they've got heavier and heavier, and therefore that has prevented the efficiency going up. And at the same time, passenger miles have grown most deeply for SUVs, which are one of the more fuel intense forms of transport compared to cars. So we've got a shift as well as passenger miles going up, we've got more and more powerful and heavier vehicles within these categories and we've got a shift out of cars and into these more fuel intense categories. So <laughs> what am I trying to say? What's this telling us? Reality is messy. We've got a broad range of products consumed, none of which is all that energy intensive. So clearly our model based on the substitution effects with a lot of rebound is way off. But of course the model based on income effects, that was also incredibly simplified in which we only produce, consumed one product at a time. Can, what can we really learn from that? It's not clear. Much more work is needed to build a picture of past developments and the future. One piece of work that Jonathan Strawle has done, a PhD student who I supervised, he's now a postdoc, <laughs> on air travel, suggests that the income elasticity of demand for air travel is very high, about three, suggesting that for that sector, income effects are very powerful. At the same time, the real price of long distance air travel has fallen by about 2% a year. So relatively modest elasticity of substitution between air travel and other goods could also be a factor. Note that the price fall of air travel is not just driven by increasing fuel efficiency. It's to a greater extent driven by the increasing efficiency of the entire operation. So the thing is, why does air travel get cheaper compared to other sectors? Air travel is like a capital-intensive, high-tech, relatively high-tech sector. And those are the sectors where technological progress tends to be fastest, pushing the prices down. So it's not the energy efficiency increases which have pushed flight prices down. It's the increases in efficiency across the whole operation. So that's not really rebound, but it is really bad news for energy efficiency across the economy. Because capital intensive, energy intensive sectors, efficiency tends to grow fast, the prices go down, and then the consumers move into them. At the same time, there can be these income effects that they're the kind also these capital intensive, energy intensive goods may often be the kind of thing that rich consumers like. So then you have the income effect as well. <laughs> okay, so short answer, it's complicated.
Okay, do I want to say something? Yeah, I think I want to, I think I'll carry on this video and say a bit about social norms. The majority of economic analysis is based on household utility functions like U is a function of C, where C is consumption. And then we can include consumption goods. Within that, we could also include environmental quality and leisure. It's basically the same idea. But what if we get utility not just from consumption of goods, leisure, manufactured goods, whatever, but also if we're affected by what others consume? Either often it could be, well, <laughs> let's follow the slide. This links to ideas such as social norms and also conspicuous consumption which is um, an idea first put forward by Torsten Veblen about over a hundred years ago and keeping up with the Joneses. Could our shift into energy intensive goods be to some extent the consequence of some kind of status gain where we think we're getting status by traveling to foreign countries, having a big flash, powerful car and so on. And is that driving us to make these energy intensive choices. If it is, there's a problem because we're basically doing it to show off to our friends, but our friends are doing the same thing to show off to us. It's a zero sum game. None, none of us end up winning this status game. And we end up maybe with a coordination problem where we're coordinating on the wrong kinds of goods that end up causing problems for everybody. It may be relevant We'll come back to these ideas later in the course. Okay, that's the end of this video and we just have one short video. I think it'll be short to wrap things up.